Dr. Billy Fields, so wonderful to have you back on the Active Towns channel. How are you, sir? Excellent. It's great to be here, John. So, so happy to talk again. Yeah, yeah. So we are going to be diving into some really cool stuff on Amsterdam. Why don't you just take this opportunity to uh, introduce yourself real quickly? Hi, I'm Dr. Billy Fields uh, from Texas State University. I teach in the public administration program. And every year I take students to the Netherlands and we look at changes that have happened over time there. And in the course of doing this for about 10 years, I've really, every year I go back, there's these amazing changes that have happened. And I hope that's one of the things we can talk about today, maybe through the lens of Amsterdam. Fantastic. And you mentioned the Texas State University and, of course, the ISTEP uh, program, the International Sustainable Transportation Engagement Program is that program that you were just mentioning where you do take, uh, you know, folks over and, and talk yeah. a little bit about and, that. And, yeah. Yeah. And this is a fun little page that we're updating over time. So I, I have this just amazing job in the summer where I take students and we look at what's happened in the Netherlands. We spend 10 days this next summer, we're going to do just the Netherlands. And then the summer after that, we're actually going to do look at London and Amsterdam uh, in, in kind of tandem. Uh, but we also have reports that we've done looking at what's happened. And then I've increasingly been really interested in putting together story maps. So we'll have a series of story maps that will begin to show up here. When we last chatted, we talked about Spain, and I'm putting together a Spain story map of best practices. And in the adaptation urbanism best practices that's listed at the top there, we have a number of locations that we'll talk about today uh, that'll show you kind of what's happening and how you're starting to see these projects. And you can also go find them. Uh, I don't want to be like hide. You should like all these places are real and you can go look at them and see what's happening. Uh, and a lot of the work that I've done really is, has been on based on other people who've showed me these locations. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So you had the opportunity to, um, you know, be there in the Netherlands and in Amsterdam a couple of times this year. And that's kind of a, a little bit unusual. You're usually there for the summer, correct? Right. Right. This year, which was crazy. I uh, have another buddy who was doing a sabbatical and we were doing a presentation in Oxford. And I said, yes, I'll go do that. So we went and gave a presentation on our book in Oxford. And then on the way back, I was able to make a stop off. And what's interesting in Amsterdam this year is there was, as we'll talk, there was a pilot program uh, that happened in the summer. And then the pilot program on Wiesperstraat, uh, I apologize for my Dutch there, was over. So I was able to kind of look at before and after. And then also in the De Pipe neighborhood, there were a number of changes that were taking place. And just over the course of six months, you got to see these changes that were taking place. I, it's it's really, you know, quite fascinating to me. And I've had this, uh, you know, discussion with you before, as well as others, is that spirit uh, that the Dutch bring to their streets of wanting to continually fine tune and adapt them they're continually looking at, you know, the conditions that are there. Like, for instance, you know, if if suddenly a, a, a street that has a cycle track is really getting crowded, et cetera, they start looking at things and start reimagining. Uh, there in, the, in Utrecht, there was a street that, you know, was just chock full of people riding bikes. The number of people riding bikes outnumber the number of people driving by eight to one. And they're like, you know what, we need to have this whole street should be a bicycle street, you know, you know, it, it should be prioritizing people on bikes, rather than just putting them into a narrow uh, cycle path. And so uh, the spirit that they have of continuing to tinker with and, and look at things and, uh, and then also at, to, to what you study, also looking at sustainability and looking at strategies that could take place to, to make it a more sustainable, more eco-friendly environment too. Yeah. And I, to me, that's, that's what's so different coming from a U.S. context. In my class in the summer with my students, I actually start off with some examples from Austin on streets and I show uh, Google street views over 10 years. And maybe there's one change, maybe no changes at all. And then we go and look at Amsterdam or other places in the Netherlands, and there's like three, four, five <laughs> changes that have taken place. There's really this sort of sense of continuous improvement and looking and thinking, how can we do better? And what you've seen, at least what I've seen and over the last 10 years is 
first, there was how do we improve active transportation, just kind of on its own. And then now what we're starting to see is layering in the green. Uh, so what I've seen, particularly in Amsterdam, is that this, the active transportation is getting better. And then you're layering on top green infrastructure as well. And that's really a dramatic change. And every time I go back, I just am like, oh, this is nicer. We've rethought this. We've done a little bit better each time. And that that's a, a, a spirit that I'd like to see spread to other places. Yeah, yeah. And when we talk about green infrastructure, what we're really talking about is infrastructure that has that that sense of climate resilience and 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 things of that nature, correct? Right, right. So essentially the idea is, you know, like a tree is a part of green infrastructure. But if you consciously start to use trees and other, you know, grass and other things, what you can do is deal both with heat from a heat perspective. Uh, is by the trees providing shade. But you can also, uh, with climate, you're starting to see more intense periods of rain and drought. So you have to combine and think about those. So water storage and then water basically dealing with floods become really important issues. So creating these sets of mini sponges throughout the community are really important. And you can combine that with bike infrastructure, for instance, where you have a cycle track and a bioswale or a wadi, as they say in the Netherlands, at least that's how I've heard it. Uh, and you put those pieces together and all of a sudden you have a much nicer environment that also is much more climate resilient as well. Yeah, this is Plantage Middenlaan in, in Amsterdam. And this street has a, a tram in the center uh, and you see cycle tracks on either side. And what's interesting over time is that this was I think it was a two, two lane road uh, up until maybe 10 or 15 years ago with a tram in the center. And then gradually over time, they've turned this into a cycle street. Uh, and it only goes three blocks. Uh, so it's, it's not super long. Right. It's a strategic cut in the car system, but the walking and biking system and tram system are left through there. So it's super efficient in terms of moving people providing that green space in the center. If you see from the video this summer, there was a drought, uh, so it's not as green and lush <laughs> as it usually looks, but it also sort of provides that sort of green infrastructure system. I've seen it sometimes where it's rained a lot and you sort of see water puddling there, but it also connects into a park. Uh, and there, yeah, you can see it's a little bit greener in that image uh, there uh, with the tram and the people moving. I've seen you know, people with dogs in their baskets moving through. It's just a very pleasant uh, environment. And my students, actually, we use this as a place to sort of give them a sense of what tying green infrastructure and bike infrastructure together looks like. You don't have to do this everywhere in the city, but the more places you can do it, the more sort of quiet park-like feel that you get. And if you just, I always, with this image, I look at the tram and I say, well, how many people are in this image? And usually my students will say, well, three or four. Uh, and I say, well, what about the tram? And the tram can hold, you know, somewhere 75 to 100 people, usually doesn't have quite that many people. Right. But you're looking at, you know, potentially like 100 people that could be moving through this at any one time. And imagine 100 cars instead. That's what this sort of spatial efficiency of transit, walking and biking looks like. And the Street of the Future name actually comes from Cornelia Dinka at Sustainable Amsterdam. She helps our students in the summer. And I use this example in the book, Adaptation Urbanism. And yeah, there we go. Uh, and she talks about this as the street of the future because it really links active transportation, green space, transit together. Uh, that's a really great video. I, I don't have that perspective uh, when I'm there, uh, but it really tells this story. And it's, it's a quiet, lovely spot. Uh, there's a dog park. One of my students uh, noted that the dog park doesn't even have a gate on it because when you come out, everything's kind of quiet and you don't have to worry about things. Uh, there's a canal that's really in the near future, in the, in the near distance there, really ties those pieces of water, green infrastructure, walking, biking, transit together. You, you mentioned the sound and noise. Um, I want to play this little video clip that you have and and have both of us not say anything because I want the audience to like hear what we hear. Hello. 
And I, I wanted to do that. <laughs> I knew that there was a little bit of wind in there, but I love that little video clip there because you can hear the 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 parent and the child talking a little bit. And, and, and that's part of the beauty of this for the street of the future is also a street that supports raising children <laughs> and yeah, growing old. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's really, it's bringing the sociability back into our social places, our public spaces. And when, when you're used to cars being around all the time, you don't know how loud they are. And I know that it gets mentioned a lot in the Netherlands about how just beautifully quiet it is. But I was this year, you know, I was in London, Oxford, and I came over uh, on a particular day and just the difference from London <laughs> to Amsterdam, it was startling how my, my brain just went, oh, this is very nice. And I, I like London. It, it's making a lot of improvements. But this was same, really different. Same, same with me with Paris. You know, when I was yeah. in Paris last November, uh, in November of 2022, not, not last month, but um, it, it, was, it was just shocking to go from Delft, you know, over to Paris and then just be like, oh, it's so it's you know the blaring horns and the noise of the of the of the cars. You could get into streets there in Paris where the noise level would go all the way down. You know, it's just like, oh, okay, that's right, okay. But the when you get that sense of um, just how quiet it is to be in a major city, get off at a major you know transit stop the central station in Amsterdam and just how quiet it is. I mean, it's, it's really, it's phenomenal when you can experience that and you're like, Oh, okay. It, it really hits home. It's like cities aren't noisy. It's the cars that make the cities right, noisy. Right. It's amazing. And that, that image that you just showed uh, there is actually one of my sort of favorite places to experience that. Yeah. Okay, so we're back at this image. So this is in the DePipe neighborhood. And just to give you a sense of the storyline of DePipe, this is one of the places where the Stop to Kindermord movement began. There are these like iconic images of people sort of fighting over barriers. There was also a plan to uh, uh, pave over one of the canals and put a highway through this neighborhood. And that was in the 60s and, and early 70s. And then over the, the same time, time period, you know, 50 years or so, the same age as me, or, or somewhere in that range, you've seen these dramatic changes that have taken place in the neighborhood. Rather than going the car route, they went the walking, biking, transit route. And this, the reason I wanted to start with this image is this little pastry shop. I, I went in and talked to the person who was there, and she said, this is my favorite street in Amsterdam. And it's been my dream to open up a pastry shop. I used to live in this neighborhood when I was a kid. And she is so excited to open this pastry shop up. And I said, oh, well, you know, what do you think about the, the sort of quiet neighborhood? How does that affect your business? And she's like, oh, there's always people here. There's so many people who want to come and experience this. And you can see the, the tables outside. It's just a really lovely space. And what they've been working on in the pipe neighborhood is actually really interesting. They're taking out somewhere in the neighborhood of like a thousand parking spaces, I think. I, I, I may not have that number exactly right, but it's a lot. Uh, they've created a parking garage underneath one of the canals to deal with some of the parking. And what they're doing is they're adding green infrastructure and rethinking the street space and the other places to make this even nicer. And some of the images that I've taken this summer First, they did sort of a tactical urbanism version, and now they're in the process of really making this permanent. And the changes that you've seen in this street uh, and this area are really dramatic. So I love Dutch streets. They take the bricks out and <laughs> they just rearrange them. So uh, I was talking to some of the guys who were working on this, and they said, oh, why are you taking images of this? This isn't very interesting at all. And I said, oh, it really is. Uh, and what they're doing is adding a little, in this image, you can't see the green space, but there's going to be additions of green space, narrowing things up. Uh, and one of the real advantages of using the bricks as well is you just take the bricks out, you rearrange what's going on underneath, and then you add the bricks back. 
Uh, so the process can be fairly painless. I mean, if you're living next to this, it's still not fun, but it happens in a much quicker time frame. But I just wanted to start a start with this image of what it looks like when they redo a street. This could be one of the reasons, and I don't have research on this, but this would be interesting, why you can do so much continuous improvement to Dutch streets is because of those bricks. I'd love to find out more about that. It seems like something that's there, but the bricks really provide this opportunity to rethink the street space well and fast. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and when you look at the patterns that the the, the bricks and the pavers are, are using, I mean, they are actually being very intentional uh, about just that. I mean, the colors and the patterns are communicating certain things. And so to your point of, yeah, if you're, if you're changing things around and you're, you're, you're changing the dimensions and you're also uh, changing the purpose of the street, uh, that's part of it is, is you can, you know, be very easily do that when it's so modular. Right, right, exactly. And this is what some of the blocks are completed. So this is what one of the complete blocks looks like. And you see the addition of green. These used like where you're seeing the green right now, there used to be a parking space for cars. Uh, and now it's a lovely little uh, community garden. You see kind of the all ages and abilities system there. The, the width of that is 11 of my feet, which are actually just about a foot. Uh, that's how I measure things. Apologies for the folks who use meters, but uh, it's about 11 feet. You also see in the background, a delivery vehicle, an electric bike delivery vehicle. And you also see a little bit of a street hump. So what you've got is really a traffic calmed street here, very narrow, but uh, the Dutch always, when I talk, they always say, oh, we don't have any infrastructure. This is one of our non-infrastructure uh, for bike streets. And I say, oh, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> the bricks, the little bit of traffic humps, all of that adds to the traffic calming. And then the green on the side also does as well. So you have a really, really slow speed street that makes it easy to walk, bike, and, and connect. And I think in the next image, I also have some car infrastructure to show how they've handled this as well. So people use cars, that's fine. They, in the process of this, they had a, a lot of public participation. And one of the things is, what, what happens if I buy something giant and I need to move it into my neighborhood? What happens if I need to drop off, you know, an older person who doesn't have access? How do I handle that? Uh, so what they've done is they've created these little zones where you can actually, they're delivery zones. If you zoom in, yeah, you can see that delivery, little delivery vehicle section. And there's, you know, one or two of these on each block. It's so calm and comfortable. You see that like a kid's bike is attached to the sign there. Yeah. It's really, really a nice combination. And what it shows is how public participation works. That public participation in dealing with the residents, having concerns and needs for cars and figuring out how to incorporate them can be done and done really well. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting too, uh, you know, going back to this image and the comment that they're making of saying, "Well, this isn't even bike infrastructure," and yeah. and, and and your your you know reply, well, actually, it kind of is, and it brings up something that that I talk about frequently, which is in North America, especially, but also in 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 many other locations around the globe. When you look at a bike map, when you look at a bicycle infrastructure map, uh, pretty much the only thing that ever really gets identified are the bike lanes. Occasionally, you'll get a few, you know, dotted green lines that are supposedly the bike friendly routes and maybe are identified by the city as a route. But what I like to emphasize is just what you said is that, you know, the literally the the thousands and thousands and thousands of low traffic, you know, these are low volume, low, low traffic streets that are lo also low speed streets that have these types of traffic calming mechanisms in there are essentially the 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 beauty of the Dutch network is their shared space. You know, it's the motor vehicle. If a motor vehicle was uh, driving down this street, hence the speed hump there, uh, it, it's calming them down, but it's shared space there. The people on bikes are sharing space with people in cars. And that's exactly what you see in, in this image here as well. Right. And so it, it's it's worth reemphasizing that. Yeah, about 70% of the Dutch network is this. It's this form of shared space 
the, what gets all the into attention is what we'll also see a little bit later are the the separated in in bicycle only space. Yeah, and it took me a long time to figure that out because uh, I went over and was looking for the cycle tracks on the higher speed main streets, and that was the show for me. And as I looked at these neighborhood streets in these thirty kilometer zones, what I really started to see is how shared space works in the Netherlands. And it's different than shared space in other places, right? Shared space works when you really calm the traffic and you make it slow. And the emphasis is on design that slows the traffic. You can't do shared space if you don't have significant traffic calming or else the cars take precedence. They push you out. I was going to say, Billy, it also takes us to what we're looking at right here is and what we were talking about earlier. It's the bricks. It's the pavers. Yeah. That, that's one of the strategies that they're they're doing is is saying, OK, we're going to use this material because it also sends a message to drivers that this is a slow speed zone. When they when they do get to the point of of laying down black asphalt, it sends a different message to the driver. It's, oh, this is a, a driver zone. This is where we, right. you know, we quote unquote, have a little bit more priority. Right, exactly. And then from a resilience perspective, depending on how you deal with the bricks, you can make water, make them permeable, you can, it's easier to sort of have the flow into the little green spaces. Uh, and then it really, long term, it can be cheaper. Because if you need to make like streets are filled with infrastructure, there's infrastructure below, it's not just the street itself. You can take out the bricks, do whatever you need, and then put them back. Uh, and they're little brick laying machines. I don't know if you've seen them over I there. Have, I love yeah. them. There's like, like a guy who's always like putting the bricks in and it just rolls out like a carpet. Uh, and I, I, I think that is an undervalued aspect of what's happening here. Yeah. So we're, we're going to talk about this project here because this is the, the, uh, the before and the after of this pilot project that took place. Um, but I will say one last thing about the, the bricks. I did have a, an extensive conversation with uh, Stefan Baer, who now works for the city of Harlem. And we talk uh, quite a bit about uh, the bricks and the use of bricks. So I'll be sure to include a, a link to that video video uh, down in the, uh, the the video description of the show notes. Yeah, uh, that was a this, good episode. I listened to that one yeah. as well. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so to walk us through this because this is, a, this is a, a pilot project that got a lot of attention internationally. Yeah, this is, and again, apologies for pronunciation, Wiesperstraat. And it is one of the streets that, you know, in that process of rethinking Dutch streets in the 60s and 70s, where they were trying to add more cars, this is one of the places where that happened. So it's a central car street through Amsterdam. You'll also note for those of you from other places, you're like, I would trade for this in a second. Uh, you look on the side and there's these giant carpets of cycle tracks. So on higher speed streets, you see these cycle tracks added and it works pretty well, but there's there's a fair amount of cars and car traffic that move through here. So in June of last year, I think is when it started, they did a pilot project for a couple of months and it looked like this. This is the exact same spot uh, that we just saw in the other image. So my students showed up here and they basically created a little snip. Cars couldn't drive through and then they had to find other routes to drive around. And they put in over the about a block or so this amazing little pocket park. We went out here. There were there were neighbors from uh, the adjacent buildings that brought down their plates and had lunch, and it was just lovely. Uh, and this is what it looks like from above, uh, so you can kind of get a sense of how big that little snip was. But they also added, you can see uh, potted plants to kind of give the pilot some, make it look at a little bit nicer. That actually was a really nice touch. It wasn't, you know, it didn't dramatically change the place, but it, it felt different and it was, it was nice. There was, however, a ton <laughs> of, of backlash. The media really, really pushed back on this. There was all sorts of discussions about emergency vehicles not being able to get through. And they really, uh, there was also kind of pushes of traffic onto other streets. So it's, and you, you can see this particularly here, this is the Binnenring, I think is the uh, sort of pronunciation, but it's a, basically an inner ring of a bicycle street that circles Amsterdam. 
And it's really, really an interesting sort of approach where it's red and it, the bicycles have priority. You can see it auto to guest there. And it usually works really, really well with very little car traffic. In this case, this was during the pilot project. And there was a lot of traffic backed up in terms of cars. And you can see the cars take the space. So there was a backup of bikes at rush hour. Uh, and it backed up a long way from this particular light in terms of managing these uh, sets of users. So it was a challenge, this sort of process. The individual space, the little mini pocket park was outstanding and amazing, but you saw this sort of push of cars into other places. Sometimes there's traffic evaporation when you go through this, and perhaps if you change the entire process and you made it permanent, you might see that traffic evaporation happen. In this case, the cars just pushed onto other routes. There was actually also in the in the sort of Plantage Midland Street of the future, I've never seen cars there before. Uh, and in this case, there were cars trying to use it to cross. There were uh, police officers <laughs> giving tickets. And I've never seen that before. So a, it, it created a pretty challenging environment. And I'm not sure exactly where this process is going to head. Perhaps cutting off the in, entire car-oriented artery through the center is not something that you want to do because it actually impacts other users. But maybe calming that traffic to slower speeds, which is, I think, where Amsterdam is headed, might be an approach that really makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, and to your point, it, it also, since it was just a pilot, it's it may not be something where you know drivers are, are thinking, oh, I really need to like change my approach. And what I mean by that is, is, you know, like when we have seen like in North America, a a similar type of situation where we've witnessed um, car evaporation, traffic evaporation happen. You know, you look at the case of of like the Embarcadero Freeway going down after the earthquake in 1989 in the Bay Area. It's like the the worries were that it was going to be Carmageddon and all these other all this traffic was going to be shifting off to other streets like you're talking about here. But in reality, it's like it just literally evaporated and they still to this day don't really know where it went. And and it's because people change their behavior. When you have options of of mobility, you will choose the most pragmatic and practical way of getting around. And, And that's really what the sort of auto low approach in Amsterdam is designed to do is is to move that behavior because Cars take up a lot of space, they create a lot of noise, and maybe they don't need to be as prevalent in the, in the center of your cities. So this is what the bicycle street usually looks like, the bin and ring uh, around. In what's, I, I should note in terms of car evaporation, there's been uh, some decent studies, uh, particularly out of Barcelona, that show what happens when you make these changes long term. There's small changes to uh, adjacent streets, but people really do find their ways around. In the case of this one major street, it's it's a bit more of challenging. But Carmageddon, it wasn't. It wasn't that bad. It was a little irritating. It didn't look as nice as this, but it it uh, it was definitely an interesting sort of look at how this process of continuous improvement takes place. You try something, you learn something, and you figure it out, and you figure out a better way to sort of make it work. I love the 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 sort of the juxtaposition here of the fact that this is the permanent street. This is the the street, the installation of the, and the greening of, of the street. And you can see that, oh yeah, I mean, that's the intention. If they do move forward with, you know, something to, you know, it, it won't look exactly like this, but you know, the point is, is that when you do decide to put in permanent infrastructure, do it for real. And make it make it nice, and make it beautiful, and make it sustainable, and uh, and and if you do that, you know, you will be amazed in terms of the acceptance of it. A lot of the resistance that we see to uh, changes to the streetscape, you see this up in your neighborhood, is is you get resistance from people going, "This is ugly." You're, you're destroying the environment of this and not not really embracing and seeing that, well, this may just be an interim step like that pilot project is an interim step uh, or a test versus this, which is very, very high quality permanent infrastructure. Right. 
uh, flex posts, I believe is what we're talking about. We're talking about flex posts. We're talking about Um, other, other interim strategies that are lighter, quicker, cheaper. You don't have to actually jackhammer out, you know, the, 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 the pavement at that point in time. But eventually we do want to do that, but we need to get the d- dimensions right and know what where we're going to do it and how we're going to do it and make sure that the earth truly isn't going to spin off its axis. Right. And that might be one of the ways to make these sort of pilots work better is to actually try in one place in the city a really high quality version of this so people know what's happening. And in Copenhagen, some of the work that I've seen really shows how that works. There's a resilience district where they've sort of tested that out. I would like to say this, though, to your point, is that you you commented on the fact that it was a really nice touch to bring in the high quality, uh, you know, planters and have them planted with really beautiful flowers in there. Again, if you're going to do lighter, quicker, cheaper materials uh, and you're going to put them out there, maybe that's interim strategy. Um, If you're going to do a pilot, again, these attention to detail to make it as beautiful as possible, uh, it may seem like, oh, you guys are talking about beauty. What, what, What does that have to do? Well, we're trying to create a more welcoming, people oriented place because that's the whole point is we want to get people out of their cars and into spaces, into places the more welcoming, the more green. Again, you were talking about it earlier. It brings the temperature down. It helps with flooding. These are all things that, you know, impact quality of life. Yeah. And it also brings the, uh, the the sort of temper of the conversations down as well, because you've, you've added something people really like in the interviews that I've done, particularly in Copenhagen, uh, with the adaptation urbanism book, what we found was when people added these sort of green spaces, people saw them as a neighborhood amenity and they didn't care about that. It was traffic calming and that it did all these resilience things. They were like, I like the green space. It's a new park for my neighborhood. And that's an interesting that little, point. Yeah. That's an interesting point that you're making there, because what you're saying is, is that people are responding to they're getting something new. It feels like an addition to their life versus a subtraction from their life. Yeah, it's a win. And I think that is one of the lessons from pilot projects that we're starting to see is this sort of adding an amenity is vital. It's not just about traffic calming or, you know, decreasing water because people just that feels very abstract to them. But adding something green and nice to their neighborhood is is really, really important in the success of these pilots, at least what from what I've seen. Yeah. So this is the overhead map, and you had mentioned earlier um, the concept of auto low, so creating yep. you know lower um, uh, volume streets and all that. What is this map uh, indicating? This is this just went live in December in Amsterdam. It's thirty kilometer streets. Eighty uh, percent of the sort of interior streets in Amsterdam will now be thirty kilometers or less. Okay. Uh, and you still see the, the, those are the blue streets. The red streets are still where you have above 30 kilometers. And one of those red streets is actually the pilot street that we just talked about, Wiesbrustrat. But what you're seeing is this real push to get slower speeds in the center of the community, that you shouldn't have high speed traffic moving through your neighborhoods. Uh, or even on your larger streets. And that's a really big change. And I think one that'll be really interesting to watch. Yeah. Well, and, and, and to, to comment a little bit about this, the Dutch government uh, you know, released in earlier in 2022, the study that made the comparison of fatal uh, crashes and injuries on streets that were 30 kilometer per hour. And really, for the most part, it goes 30 kilometers per hour to 50 kilometers per hour. They don't do a whole lot of stuff in between. Right. In the United States, we have all sorts of little increments of speed, like five miles per hour. But most, I would gamble that most of the- kilometers an hour. (laughs) Exactly. You know, most of these, most of these uh, uh, streets in red here, I'm gambling or would bet that is, is, is a 50 kilometer per hour street. But that report basically came back and said, yeah. The, the fatality and serious injury rates are unacceptable. They're too high. We really do need to have a push to try to get these streets converted, you know, also to 30 kilometers per hour, which makes sense. Because when you're talking about in an environment of a city where you have vibrancy, where you have all of these people, uh, you know, 
these people oriented places like this, last thing in the world you want is to, you know, have a, a, a space like that. I mean, would you rather have something that's, you know, you know, 50 kilometers per hour, 30 miles per hour and above on the right, that's noisy to the point that we were making earlier versus, you know, something that is, you know, like on the left here or, you know, more appropriately done well like this on the left. Right, right, exactly. And I guess you can look you can look at it as a series of steps, right? This is the sort of sustainable safety vision zero model uh, and what it looks like when you really take it seriously. <laughs> if, for example, we wanted to take it uh, seriously in steps, what we would need to do is really push for that design that you saw on Wiesperstraat, the original design, uh, where there were cycle tracks on either side. If you have speeds above 30 kilometers an hour, I mean, 30 miles an hour, maybe 30 kilometers, depending on how you look at it. Well, th that's the way they, that's the way they look at it is, is anything above 30 kilometers per hour, that's their dividing line. Then you need to have pr provide a separate infrastructure. And part of the reason why too, is that, you know, is, is that they do have that jump from 30 kilometers per hour to 50 kilometers per right. hour. Right. And, and that's, that's what sustainable safety vision zero is about when you implement it well. You take it seriously. You traffic calm the neighborhood streets. Yeah. And then what you do is on streets above that speed, where if somebody gets hit, really bad things are going to happen. You have separated spaces and you do that over and over and over again. That's what Real Vision Zero is about. And that's one of the things that I'm really impressed with always in the Netherlands. And then this next step of 30 kilometers streets in the center of cities is a, is a great advance. Yeah. And uh, up on screen right now, we have the um, Amsterdam uh, website for the city. And again, looking at the policy uh, and, you know, traffic safety, the policy that they're they're really striving to do this. And this gets to the point that we were talking about to open up is just that spirit of continuous improvement and working to try to get to uh, the ultimate goal, which is to try to eliminate those preventable deaths and serious crashes and injuries. Yeah, and in going going back to Cornelia Dinka uh, from Sustainable Amsterdam, on one of the tours, she took us to a spot that's also on the Binnen Ring, uh, and they it's designated as a black spot or crash hot spot. And I think that they've changed the design of that particular place four times over the last 10 years to try and improve the safety, and they keep making it better. It wasn't good to start, and they that like this isn't like, you know, we're not going to like paradise land where everything is great. There are real problems and real people and it's challenging. Yeah. But really rethinking over time is is super important. And that's what the lesson that you really can take from from the Netherlands. Yeah. And I've got her website back up again. So, folks, you can uh, dive into some of her additional articles uh, that she has out there. Um, yeah. And that place on the right there, that, John, if you scroll down again there, the the five unique projects for green and climate proof Amsterdam. This is uh, on the right, one of the, I think it's one of the new spots where they've added green tram tracks uh, in the center of Amsterdam. And it took a space that really was kind of, it wasn't great. And then it transformed it into a little park. And there's this fantastic little water feature. You can see it there. You can actually play with the water uh, and the water, you can move it from one side to the other. My students had a big time there. It's great. Nice. I love it. I love it. Yay. Well, hopefully we'll get Cornelia on the uh, podcast uh, yeah. one of these days. Uh, but hey, Billy, thank you so much for doing this. It's fun just to kind of catch up a little bit and uh, learn a little bit about what you're observing there in uh, Amsterdam. This is great. Thanks so much for the opportunity to chat. I always appreciate it. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.